I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. John Saar, a PhD electrical engineer, chief technology officer at One Radio, and former professor and interim chair of electrical engineering at the University of Washington. Dr. Saar's specializations include passive and bi-static radar systems, VHF radar systems, statistical signal processing, and computer programming. And his past research includes research in VHF passive bi-static radar for ionospheric turbulence and the augmentation of existing radar systems with additional illumination sources to improve weather data, ionospheric research, and aerospace surveillance capabilities. Dr. Saar has a BSEE from Caltech and a PhD in electrical engineering from Cornell University and has served on the boards of the Evergreen School in Shoreline, Washington and Casa Latina in Seattle, where he supports a focus on education and outreach services for the Latin American immigrant community. So, John, welcome. It is a pleasure and a true honor to have you with me today, sir. Well, it's great to be here, Tim. I'm uh, delighted that you've reached out to me. Well, thank you. And so for the audience, we have been talking off and on for the last few weeks. Um, the work that you are doing is very similar to what Mitch Randall is doing, although you have kind of a different approach and then your company has yeah. different goals as well. So it's exciting to be able to cover this topic of passive radar, which is be rapidly becoming one of my favorite ideas in terms of technology. So today we are talking about drones and passive radar, and I want to start with your company, One Radio, which was recently selected by the U.S. Air Force AF Works program for an SBIR Phase 1 contract to use passive radar for drone detection, geolocation, and fingerprinting. So let me start with the basics. Can you give us a brief overview of what passive radar is and how it differs from a traditional radar system? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll correct one little thing. I'm no longer the CTO at One Radio, but I was the original CTO and one of the co-founders of the company. I'm not connected directly with them anymore, but I'm, I, I still communicate with them regularly and I'm a big fan because they're doing great work. Okay, so uh, passive radar, passive radar. Uh, passive radar is a radar technique in which uncooperative transmitters provide radio wave illumination of targets and then special receivers and signal processors provide an essentially conventional radar data product so uh, and, and the, by conventional radar data product i mean a, a two-dimensional array where range is on one axis and doppler velocity information is on the other axis so in my case, uh, the way I got started was I've used mostly commercial FM broadcasts at 100 megahertz to do upper atmospheric physics research. That's, that's where I come from. I come from a definitely not an aerospace background. But I've also used some UHF uh, digital TV broadcasts. Now, now, passive radar is not the only term used, and that can be confusing to people coming to the field. So, for example, uh, Lockheed Martin has long been a player in this field. And they usually prefer the term passive coherent location or PCL because of their own development of an instrument called Silent Sentry, uh, which is a, a, actually an incredibly cool device. And it's intended for aerospace applications, you know, looking for point targets like aircraft and cruise missiles and things like that. Uh, a British concern called Roke Manor Mission Systems has developed a system that they call Seldar. Uh, which uses the signals broadcast by cell phone base stations. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. I've, I've been there and visited them, and uh, that's, uh, you know, they also have done great work, and they certainly predated my own entry to the field. But I have to say the funniest term that I've ever heard for passive radar is uh, uh, called self-jamming radar. <laughs> and I can explain where that comes from. Uh, but if I had known that term when I'd started, I would have embraced it and called my own radar a self-jamming radar just because the term is so funny. One of, one of the problems in, des in, in describing passive radar has to do with the enormous variety of technologies that are somewhat similar. So when I use the term passive radar, what I mean is a radio receiver system which produces range and Doppler information by observing the scatter of completely uncooperative transmitters. So in my case, for example, I listen to commercial FM broadcasts. Uh, rock and roll stations turn out to be pretty good radar transmitters uh, viewed the right way. And, but they're completely uncooperative. I had no idea what the signal was going to be until it was actually sent. And so that's, that's the, the kind of sense in which I use the term passive radar. And that's very much exactly the sense in which uh, Lockheed's um, silent sentry works as well. They, 
They didn't have any prior knowledge of the FM or TV broadcast that they were looking at. There are some other things which are close. Passive radar receivers, um, some of them simply augment radars whose waveform is cooperatively known to the passive radar receivers. Such a system is sometimes referred to as a bistatic radar or a hitchhiker. So an example is uh, can be found in the U.S. Air Force AWACS planes, which can provide illumination for planes flying in the forward over hostile areas. And and so that, that means that these planes don't have to reveal themselves by having a radar transmitter on board. And, and it's important to keep in mind that a conventional radar transmitter is about as subtle as a strobe light. Nobody likes to be near a strobe light. They flash, 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 and they're loud and noisy, and they're basically yelling, here I am. And this is the basis for uh, why anti-radiation missile exists. Find the noisy thing and then explode near it. Uh, another kind of passive-like radar system, there's a variety of things here. There's a picket fence, a fan beam, a burglar alarm, or forward scatter radars. Such radar systems can be passive or active, but typically provide no range information. They do, however, tend to provide good Doppler information. Forward scatter is an interesting topic all by itself for one basic reason. It's impossible to be stealthy against a forward scatter radar for more or less the same reason that it is impossible to avoid casting a shadow. Forward scatter radars have limited utility, but they're pretty much impossible to beat for uh, stealth detection. There's, there's kind of no way to get around that. So passive radar is also a subset of uh, bistatic radar. And the word bistatic simply means that the transmitter and the antenna are not in the same place. And they could be you know, separated by you know, a, a kilometer or hundreds of kilometers in, in, in my case. And the passive part means that the receiver has no prior knowledge of what the transmitter signal was. Passive radar is also a surprisingly old technology. The first system that I know of was the, the German Klein Heidelberg system uh, from the 1940s, which used the British chain home radars uh, to uh, detect aircraft basically near Britain so that they could get some early warning. And that the uh, Klein Heidelberg system had no transmitter. It just looked at the, uh, the transmissions from the chain home radar. And since the chain home radar was, you know, basically a pretty, pretty simple thing, even though you didn't know what the radar waveform was in advance, it was always the same thing, bang, 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 bang. And, you know, you could figure that out and take advantage of that in the signal processor. So for the audience, I want to break down what passive radar is and what makes this so unique. Now, when I think of radar, I tend to visualize one of the big rotating dishes that's on a Navy ship, right? You have the dish that's spinning around and it's projecting a beam. You describe this as like a spotlight and it is basically putting a beam of electromagnetic energy out there and then looking for reflections for that but you don't necessarily have to use that big dish or the beam because the environment around us is full of electromagnetic radiation. So instead of creating your own beam, you could actually just uh, basically look for Starlink signals, look for FM rock station signals, look for direct TV signals. And since you know the reference point of the original signal, and you can look for reflections of that as well, you can use that as your beam, right? So passive radar is, is very different. And this enables smaller devices. And, you know, and it's also uh, like, as you said, it can be covertly used because you're not sending anything yeah. out. You're only listening. Yeah. And you also don't have to get licensing for it, right? Because you're not putting anything out into the environment. In, in the U.S., yes. Uh, the U.S. basically says you, you can receive anything that you want to. And as long as you don't try to make any money from it, you're okay. There are places where it's actually illegal to have uh, receivers. But in the U.S., broadly speaking, you can listen to anything you want. Ah, okay. Are these devices smaller, typically, than even a... I, I, I mean, what would a... What, what would this look like for the average person? Um, uh, like, not much, actually. Um, one of the huge... Boy, where to start? One of the huge advantages of these passive radar systems is that they have no transmitter. And transmitters, you know, a typical transmitter, it's a radar transmitter, it's going to be a kilowatt, 50 kilowatts, something like that. That's just a big old box. I mean, a 50 kilowatt transmitter is going to be the size of a washing machine. 
and a megawatt transmitter is going to be the size of well a garage you know it's it's got some size to it and part of the reason is you just need a huge power supply for it but a, a passive radar is a receive only system and so it's can be extremely low power the one thing that you do need the, the actually the more power hungry part is uh, the the computation you know, we use uh, GPUs and FPGAs and those are actually more power hungry than the receiver itself but the receiver can be quite small um, there's some that I'm experimenting here in my home as I uh, know that I'm retired but they're the size of a deck of cards and and of course that's just microscopic so yeah the main thing is that in order to do passive radar you need to be willing to do a lot of computation and it turns out that in the last 20 years computation is free and you can have a lot of it you can have teraflops of computation on a hobbyist budget and that just wasn't true when companies like Lockheed were getting started they they had to put a huge amount of work into really doing some deep engineering uh, trade-off studies to be able to make their radar work and they did and boy hats off to them for doing a good job but we came along you know 10 15 years later and some technologies arose that just allowed us to make a much simpler much lower cost system uh, one of them was computation uh, desktop computers started getting inexpensive and then uh, uh, one of the more amusing uh, two two kind of amusing sources of cheap computation came along and uh, one of them was, was Bitcoin. So uh, people do Bitcoin mining. You need a lot of compute horsepower to do that. And the other big source, which is even funnier, is computer gamers. Uh, the big GPUs that they use to do rendering of the scenes turn out to be pretty righteous computers to do radar data processing. It's, uh, it's kind of wonderful. But the other thing, uh, to get back to one of your other uh, points, was the source of illumination. And so, you know, I use commercial FN mostly. I'm doing some digital TV stuff too. Uh, people have used cell phones like this British company. Uh, you've mentioned that there's some people, a German company, I believe, that's uh, looking at uh, Starlink signals. And there's others. People have used, uh, tried to use GPS. Doesn't work as well for interesting reasons. Uh, but there's a, a variety of uh, pretty interesting waveforms that can be used. I mean, one waveform that I could use in principle would be to look at the local weather radars. They go bing, 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 you know, at approximately a thousand pulses per second. And it's a simple waveform. So that one uh, actually would be relatively straightforward to use. So there's a bunch of sources. And, and what it, what's important to realize about human activities on the Earth is planet Earth shines as bright as a small star in the radio spectrum. We're louder than the sun just because of all the FM broadcasts and the cell phones and the TV transmitters and the Starlink satellites. We, we put out a huge amount of electromagnetic radiation. And so, you know, a way of thinking about, you know, how could po passive radar possibly work? Well, it works sort of like the same reason that our eyes work. We're being illuminated by the sun and we can see all kinds of stuff around us. We can resolve at an angle. If we've got binocular vision, we can get some sense of the range to it. We can notice that the targets are moving. So it's really important to think that there's a whole different kind of sunlight shining on the planet just from all the human radio activities. And that's what we're taking advantage of. So I wanted to touch on um, another group that is using this. This this story just came out. I saw this actually while I was working on questions for this interview, and I was just blown away. So it's one of those things where, you know, things happen in clusters, and I guess this might be one of those. Um, but last month, Army Technology Magazine published an article entitled, Germany Demonstrates Passive Radar System Using Starlink Satellite Radiation. And what they had written was, the opportunistic use of existing transmitters from the Starlink network opens the door for covert operation that's robust against jamming and better at detecting stealth targets. So in their case, they are really leveraging this Starlink signal. Um, do you think that that and DirecTV are really big enabling factors for passive radar? Or is it just the, the uh, I guess, the continuously decreasing cost of computing power that's really driving it forward? Yeah, so I mean that that was interesting to read, and it's an interesting um, contrast to GPS. Uh, people have been using GPS satellites as passive illuminators for a long time. Turns out they don't; it doesn't work all that well because GPS is not terribly bright. It's um, mm -hmm. and this is a, a technical issue, which a GPS has a little bit of signals in it. It's got a megahertz of bandwidth for the common uh, 
downlink signal, but there's only about 50 hertz worth of bandwidth in the signals. And what that means is GPS signals can be fairly quiet. And, and so that just means, you know, the signal has to be loud enough to hear. And you can integrate for a long time in order to build up what's called the processing gain of the signal. But with Starlink and also DirecTV, the issue is that uh, people are trying, um, it, you know, satellite internet would not be interesting if you could only get 50 bits per second through it. Yeah. What you want is megabits per second, approaching gigabits per second. And what that means is there's a huge amount of non-repeating information in the waveform, and that's that does two things. It allows you to get really good range resolution, that's from the bandwidth, but because the signal you don't know ahead of time, it has to be higher power. That's one of the reasons why the Starlink satellites are in a fairly low Earth orbit compared to GPS. They need, they just can't afford to broadcast those those internet signals from, you know, uh, geosynchronous orbit or halfway to geosynchronous orbit. They've got to be down close because Electric power is a precious commodity on, on spacecraft. So that's why there's these thousands of these Starlink satellites. It's so they can simply put enough power on the ground to have your internet work. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's some absolutely stupendous technical accomplishments to get Starlink up there. But one of the things they basically can't avoid, they can't avoid being a useful radar transmitter. It just has to be that way. There's just no way around it. There's no way... There's no good way for Starlink to make their satellites not be good radar transmitters. They just have to be. And, you know, the only thing you have to be willing to do is computation. And today, computation is cheap. It's just cheap. Well, so in terms of detecting drones, one of the things I had wondered about was why use passive radar instead of looking for the signals that the drone emits and receives, right? Because they have control signals, they have uh, streaming video, a lot of them, things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is, is it better to just triangulate with that? Or is this kind of working ahead? Because one of the things that's coming is increasing autonomy for drones and future right. drones to avoid jamming probably won't have that. Right. So uh, it is certainly the case that many drones, certainly, you know, consumer level drones, there's the control signal going up, there's the video coming back. And yeah, they're just basically saying, here I am, here I am. And, you know, yeah. just doing triangulation on those is a perfectly good way to detect those drones. But there's more and more drones now which are doing two things. One of them is that they're autonomous. They don't need a control signal. They just go out and do what they're supposed to do. And the other thing is, if you're willing to invest a little bit more, there's there is such a thing as making uh, low observable uh, data communication. So spread spectrum kinds of things can make it harder uh, for you to tell what the drone's doing because you only hear a little bit of a squirt of data every once in a while uh, if you're using a conventional somewhat narrow band receiver. So with a, with a passive radar system, you just Im immediately defend against all of that stuff. It works, it works on anything. And really the only kind of drones that you can't see easily with passive radar are tiny ones, the tiny ones the size of my fist, because then the scattering cross-section just becomes so small. And if you think about it, you can't do anything, you can't really deploy weapons with a drone that's the size of your fist. Those kind of drones can do surveillance, but they can't deliver nasty things, is, is really the way it comes down to. So yeah, indeed, um, Tony, my, my colleague at uh, One Radio, uh, he and I got involved in a DARPA project uh, called uh, the Aerial Dragnet. How long ago was it? 2017, something like that. And uh, we were asked to provide a passive radar complement to a larger uh, instrument sensor for the University of Washington Applied Physics Lab uh, in their project with DARPA. And to my very pleasant surprise, the, the passive radar turned out to be the star of the show. Uh, I, it worked much better than I thought it did. And there were some other kind of interesting uh, technical issues. For example, we were using primarily digital TV broadcasts in and around 600 megahertz. So half meter wavelength, you know, length of your arm, basically. And as it happens, uh, one of the interesting propagation characteristics at those frequencies is they can penetrate foliage pretty well. So you can see through trees. And another thing is that they will diffract around corners of things like buildings. So we had, we one of the requirements for the DARPA project was to be able to demonstrate non-line of sight detection. And we were able to, we could detect drones that we couldn't, you could not see by looking at them because they were behind obstacles just from the diffraction issues. So anyway, it wound, wound up being a kind of a cool project and it relied on 
<laughs> one of the things was a lot of computation, but it was all based upon um, NVIDIA powerful um, gamer cards. <laughs> I mean, there were hundreds yeah. of teraflops that we were able to put together and it worked. But to my astonishment, it worked. Well, and again, one of the tremendous things about this is, you know, once you get rid of the need for that big radar emplacement, right, that giant spinning dish and the, you know, thousands or millions of watts of output, whatever they're using there, you know, it, it, it allows this miniaturization. And so one of the things I wondered about was um, this idea of, you know, could you deploy a mesh network of passive detectors, you know, if you had these inside of, for instance, if you had them inside of vehicles, the military convoy or you know tanks on a battlefield or or you know anything along those lines where you have lots of little devices that are linked you know could you use that to basically provide really high resolution for a battle space you could not only detect drones but i wondered if you know potentially missiles ground vehicles or even personnel might become visible oh you know absolutely um you know one of the one of the kind of a funny demonstration of the small size, the original radar receiver that I built for the Manast Hass Ridge radar doing the ionospheric physics was the size of a toaster oven, the, the receiver part of it. And we had um, antennas that the antennas that we used at the, at the Manast Hass Ridge site were, well, there was a log periodic dipole array and a Yagi. And basically think of something that looks like a rooftop TV antenna. So that was the size of those things. And they were fixed. They weren't, they weren't rotating or anything like that. Um, but I had a, a funny side effect of that is that there was a, a conference about passive radar that happened at the University of Washington in 2006, something like that, maybe 2005, uh, in which at some point w during one of the breaks, I offered to take a, a bunch of people from that conference over to the building where I had the, the UW version of the receiver. And I brought them over near the building and I told them that the antenna that we use is within your line of sight. Can any of you see it? And so here are all these radar experts who are trying to figure out where in the Dickens is the antenna for this radar. He just told us we can see it. Nobody found it. And what it was, was a wire dangling out a window, just a, just a piece of wire. There was nothing special about it. A, a little more extreme version of that is uh, one of the it has to do with this company one radio. Uh, we use this fancy receiver that we built to do p passive radar among other things. And one of the most amusing things that we did was a uh, do a passive radar looking at digital TV broadcasts and the antenna for this system was about an inch long, an inch of wire sticking out the end of coaxial cable. That was the antenna. And even more than that, that antenna was not located on a roof. It was located inside the computer room, one of the noisiest environments you could think of. And it still worked. And this, this indicates one of the subtle technology features of passive radar is that passive radars tend to be not noise limited. They're not limited by the weakness of the signal. They're limited by all the other stuff that's coming in at the same time. So they're what we'd call in the radar world clutter limited. They're limited by all the other stuff coming in that you don't care about. So when that happens, at some point, it doesn't really matter if the antenna has any gain. You don't need one of those great big rotating dishes. What you have to be willing to do is to do all the computation to push away all the stuff you don't care about, which is typically stuff that's not moving. So at the one radio place, we could see, for example, helicopters flying over Seattle, and we could measure their Doppler velocity and count their blades and see how fast the blades are going around. That's uh, fingerprinting, I know, is one of the, the things that you're interested in. But we could also see the highway traffic on I-5 going through Seattle. That was easy to see. And in fact, we could see highway traffic on uh, 520 crossing Lake Washington. All very easy to see. And so there's, there's some weird technology choices that you get to make with a passive radar, some of which are very surprising, like the fact that you could get away with a, a tiny antenna, really tiny. And, you know, one of the features of a tiny antenna is that it's not resonant. And it, and it turns out that you can say, well, if a receiver is not transmitting or if your system is not transmitting, then it's completely stealthy. It's not quite true. If you have a resonant antenna, it's going to have a scattering cross section that says, I'm an antenna and I'm here. But if you have a non-resonant electrically short antenna, it just looks like, you know, a doorknob. It doesn't look like anything. 
So there are some, there are some really interesting things you can do if you understand that you're clutter limited and not noise limited. So again, you know, a lot there's a, there's a fair amount of details here, but it's really fascinating some of the engineering trade-offs that can happen. One of the other one of the other engineering trade-offs is many people know that radars have an R to the fourth law. Here you've got your transmitter, you send radiation out, the radiation gets weaker as R to the R squared, scatters off an airplane, and it comes back with another R squared loss. So it's R to the fourth. So the signal strength drops off fast with distance from the uh, the radar. With with passive radar, it can be an R squared law, not an R fourth law. That turned out to be really important for the drone detection ex exercise with DARPA. And the reason is if the transmitter is much further away than the targets you're looking at, then basically it's not an out and back path, it's just an out path. It's only one of the R squared factors. So it, it just turns out there's some interesting things that happen if you're willing to go to the trouble to build a high dynamic range receiver and do a lot of computation. And these days, both are available on a hobbyist budget. Yeah, well, I want to ask about that um, because I know that hobbyists have built some of these. It's a very niche thing, but it's it's not limited so much by availability or money. It's more of just knowledge and interest. And so, for exactly. folks who wanted to get into this, um, you know, what do you think the cost typically is for hobbyists? Um, what are some of the things that they need? I understand a software defined radio is one thing that's been used. And it, are, yeah. are there like parts lists or anything like that that are online that people could buy? You know, one of the, well, let me, let me not ramble at first. So the, the radar that I'm building here at home, it's got, a, you know, a four antenna channels up to four antenna antenna channels. It's a software defined radio. And, uh, the, I need two of these radios and they cost about $500 a piece. They're pretty nice radios. They're tunable over a very wide range. But I do know um, there's a one of my colleagues in this space science world built a working passive radar with a laptop and a $20 dongle, a $20 USB dongle. Now, he's a really smart guy and he knew what he was doing. He understood exactly what kind of signal processing you need to do this that made this work. But the, the RF hardware is cheap. It's just cheap. Uh, there's an issue I mentioned a while ago, this issue of dynamic range. Um, take a while to go into what that means, but what it basically means is how can you see a loud signal and a small signal at the same time? So if you're looking at the transmitter, that's a great big old signal. Your TV's coming over that. But if you're looking for an airplane or something like that, well, that signal is going to be a million times weaker, a billion times weaker, something like that. Can your receiver see that weak signal at the same time as you see the strong signal. And if mm -hmm. I can give you a sunlight analogy of this, you're driving down the road at night and you, you've got your headlights on and you see the headlights of the car coming at you. And well, you know, you get blinded by it. You have no trouble seeing where that car coming at you is. But what you really like to know is about that bunny that's about to jump up on the road and it's just scattering a tiny bit of light. And so if you're, if your windows are a little foggy and there's light kind of spreading all around, you're never going to see the bunny. And that's the technical problem. That's really the big technical problem with passive radars is getting receivers that have enough dynamic range to see big things and little things at the same time. That's also where this joke expression for passive radar comes from, the self-gemming radars, because they're listening to this huge signal all the time and then they want to see a little thing. I mean, that's what jammers do is they transmit a lot of noise into your radar so that you can't see the, the little things. So... It turns out that, you know, if you want to have a, a decent shot at building a passive radar, uh, if you're going to look at commercial FM broadcasts, uh, you can do it with a garden variety desktop and a, an SDR, and you don't need a, a GPU to do that. You can do, you can do FM radio processing just on the plain old computer that you got in front of you on a laptop, you know, on this desktop that I've got. If you want to do digital TV, uh, the bandwidth is significantly greater and there are immediate implications about how much signal processing you want to do and so then yeah you you'd like a, to have maybe a 10 teraflop gpu but gamers have 10 teraflop gpus these days so that's totally doable i mean a 10 teraflop gpu is eight hundred dollars seven hundred dollars something like that 
Yeah. A again, this is well within the budget of hobbyists, which opens yeah. the yeah. door to experimentation. And one of the things yeah. that you mentioned earlier, and I appreciate your getting into this, was civilian applications. Like in Seattle, you mentioned being able to look at helicopters, count helicopter blades, being able to say, you see Interstate 5 and the vehicles passing on it. And there yeah. is an entire world of civilian and hobbyist applications out there. I didn't touch on that primarily because we were coming at it from uh, the one radio and the German story, which are both military mm -hmm. in nature. But also, right. you know, it's like drinking from the fire hose. There is so much that you can do with this that it's like, where do you, where do you even start? So I appreciate your sharing that. So here's a really interesting application of passive radar that I've heard that is medical in nature. And it goes like this. You've got a you got a patient in the hospital, and there they are, and they've got you know all these tubes and lines coming out of them, and some of them are heart rate monitors, and others are, you know, breathing monitors, and some of it is the patient moving around, and, you know, those are each one of those things has its own wire, and it just makes the patient um, environment more complicated. Well, it turns out that one of the things you can find in hospitals is Wi-Fi signals. And turns out Wi-Fi signals are not bad passive radar signals. So you're not going to see anything 50 miles away from your router, but you can see stuff within a few hundred feet. And so one of the things you can do is you can see the chest wall motion. And so you can see if the patient is breathing just by looking at the Wi-Fi signals in the room. So the chest wall, you know, that moves on like a, you know, 10 second period. Heart rate is, you know, one hertz, two hertz, something like that. And that's going to make little variations in chest wall and, you know, things like carotid artery. And you can see that stuff with by looking carefully at Wi-Fi. If the whole patient is shifting around in their bed, you can detect that. No problem. Uh, if there are two people in the room and you thought there should only be one, you're going to be able to tell if the, one of them is moving around. You'll, you'll be able to detect, does this person have any visitors? So uh, that's an incredibly wonderful non-invasive way to do patient monitoring that uh, just makes everybody's life better. It makes the patient more comfortable. There's fewer wires coming off them. Uh, it permits remote monitoring of the, the patient's status. Just all kinds of great things like that. That's one of the really coolest, you know, civilian type applications of passive radar that I've seen. I, I do want to touch on the Manistash Ridge radar really quickly, and I'm going to put a link to the paper in here. Again, it was called mm -hmm. the Manistash Ridge Radar, a passive by static radar for upper atmospheric radio science. So one of the right. interesting quotables from this was, since this passive system has no transmitter, there are enormous benefits in safety, expense, shielding, antenna, receiver design and licensing issues. And so we, we yeah. did talk about, we touched on the licensing aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about the ionospheric research aspects of this? What were you listening for with the Manistash Radar Project? Yeah, so that's, of course, my background. It has nothing to do with aerospace. That's something I got kind of roped into uh, much later. Um, so my, my, un, my graduate research, my PhD, you know, most of my uh, time as a professor at the UW was involved a, in studying a kind of turbulence that happens at the base of the Northern Lights. And uh, the name of that turbulence is, well, it has a couple of names, but one of them is um, E region electrojet irregularities, you know, a bunch of buzzwords. But the basic idea is that if you think about where the Northern Lights are and, and what they are, the Northern Lights are basically fluorescent lights. And if you've ever seen the kind of curtain effect with the Northern Lights, what you're actually seeing is the result of electrons streaming up and down the Earth's magnetic field. That's where the, the, these fingers are, why they're kind of vertically oriented. And it turns out that at the base of the Northern Lights, at an altitude of around 105 kilometers, 60 miles, um, the electric currents cross the magnetic field lines. And they, they do it... it and in what's called a Hall current, which is that the electrons are flowing in a direction that's actually perpendicular to the electric field. And at this altitude in the ionosphere, the interesting thing is that the electrons can Hall drift pretty easily, but the ions are kind of stuck in the fairly thick soup of the neutral atmosphere. And so what you have are these electrons that are racing through the ions. And when that, that drift velocity of the electrons exceeds the speed of sound, it's about 300, 350 meters per second, the whole region just bursts into a sonic boom noise, acoustic noise, uh, that happens to be in kind of the human audible range. Now, it's, those are sound waves in a plasma, 
and they don't make their way to the Earth's surface, so you can't hear them. But it turns out they're big scatterers of radio waves. And uh, one of the problems with this phenomenon being at an altitude of 60 miles or you know 105 kilometers is this part of the sky in geophysics circles is sometimes known as the ignorosphere because it's hard to study. It's too high for airplanes and balloons and it's too low for satellites. And so remote sensing is the name of the game. And uh, that's what we did. And it turns out that um, 100 megahertz where FM radio broadcasts are is a really good wavelength to study the scatter of these uh, sound waves. They have other interesting features in that they are what's called highly field aligned. And that's confusing the first time you run into it. What it means is that the, those sound waves can only travel in directions that's perpendicular to the magnetic field. So you could think of the, these sound waves as living kind of on the surface of a lake. If you think about a lake, uh, water waves on a lake are also field aligned. They're field aligned by gravity. They travel along the lake perpendicular to the force of gravity. Something kind of like that is happening in the ionosphere. There are other things that happen in the ionosphere as well uh, that are also that also scatter radio waves uh, surprisingly well. But I study this one, uh, this one kind of um, turbulence called auroral electrojet irregularities. I built the passive radar uh, had to do with uh, my, my graduate work was using a radar at 50 megahertz. And, and it turns out this group at Cornell has produced a, a huge data set at 50 megahertz. And there was a European radar that ran at uh, 140 megahertz. So, uh, and these were both conventional pulse mode radars. Uh, one of the things that puzzled me as a graduate student was that the, the data that was produced, in particular, the, uh, the Doppler power spectrum that came back, uh, they, they didn't agree. They didn't, look, they didn't look like each other. They were just different. And so I thought when I became a professor, well, wouldn't it be interesting to build a radar at, at some frequency in between and see if there was some kind of geophysical process that was big at 50 megahertz, but small at 150 megahertz. So 100 megahertz would be kind of interesting. And, you know, I knew, well, the FCC is never going to let me build a radar at 100 megahertz because I'll just annoy everyone who's trying to listen to rock and roll. But then it occurred to me, you know, rock and roll signals might actually be okay radar waveforms. And, you know, the rest is history. The, the reason that a rock and roll FM radio station is a good radar waveform uh, there's a there's a, a subtle thing in, involving in radar. So everybody has a basic idea how radar works. You, you send out a pulse, bing, and you listen for the little echo come back a little while later. And so you might think that, well, if you're going to make a radar, what you have to do is send out a brief pulse, bing, and then listen for the echo come back a little while later and measure the time of flight and those kind of things. Turns out that if you study radar uh, a little more carefully, there's a property of a radar waveform called the ambiguity function. And it's a little bit, it's like a generalized kind of autocorrelation function. And it turns out that what matters in radar waveforms is not whether you send a brief pulse, but whether the autocorrelation function of that waveform looks like a brief function. And so what that means is that it turns out that a signal that's pure noise actually makes a pretty good radar waveform. And rock and roll is pretty noisy. And there's some other stuff involving FM going on there, but it turns out that you really can measure the distance to the target very accurately with waveforms like FM rock and roll, like digital TV, like Wi-Fi, like uh, Starlink. Um, these are great waveforms. They're on 100% of the time. And so you might think you could never tell the distance. But in fact, that's not true. Uh, it's this more subtle property of waveforms that uh, allows you to measure the distance and as well as the Doppler shift. John, let me thank you so much for your time today. Again, it has been a true pleasure and honor having you with me. Uh, so I want to close actually by asking again about One Radio, your former company. Mm -hmm. They're in that SBIR phase one through AF Works. What is coming next for them, for One Radio, and for this unique approach to passive radar in the first few months of 2024? Yeah, the one radio receiver, I mean, the, the opportunities are endless. I, I, let me tell you where the name comes from. The, why is it called one radio? And that's because uh, my my colleague and good friend, Tony, turns out to come from the, the aviation world. And, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, go into a, a big modern jet airplane, you know, 747, A800, A300, whatever, and if you lift the lid of the cockpit and you look in there, you're going to find about 30 to 40 radios. 
there's just a whole lot of radios in there. And, you know, they're all, you know, one radio at a time. And, and some of them are, are duels for redundancy. And there's just a whole bunch of radios in there. And by building this really high speed receiver that could do, you know, four giga samples per second, we realized we could do all the radio functions in one radio if we were just willing to do computation. So you can imagine having, you know, the, the newest uh, one radio uh, receiver um, is it's the size of a GPU. It, it literally fits into a PCI slot. And imagine the mass and weight and cooling things that you, you saw by having one radio replace all those 30 radios. Now, turns out, um, and there's other things as well. So if, if you think about a company like Boeing or, or really more like an airline like Alaska Air, they've got to have stocks of all these different radios to do maintenance on their planes. But suppose there was just one radio that you just change it in and and pull it out. You don't have to worry about 30 different radios. You just put in one radio and then it does everything. And it's so small, you can have redundant radios there. And, you know, if one of them stops working for whatever, you got more. So that's where the name of the company comes from. The, it's basically the high speed sampling, the full bandwidth. You can do, if you want to run a spectrometer or a spectrogram with one hertz frequency resolution from zero to two gigahertz, you can do it with this radio. You can't do that with other radios. And the one radio, the thing that made one radio special is the patent that uh, that we have. And that's that you can change the uh, bit resolution, which is typically about seven bits if you've got a, you know, four gigahertz sampler. Well, we figured out a way to have it be 13 bits, which is a huge increase in the dynamic range. So you can actually be listening to big signals and small signals at the same time coming in from the same antenna. And that's where the where one radio really shines. And and the other thing about it is that you don't. It's not a burst mode radio. There there are samplers you can get that can take you know a tenth of a second, and then they have to like relax for a while. This one can stream that data all day long, and it'll keep going until you run out of computation or run out of storage space. So that's a that's a novel feature of the one radio receiver. And I'm just tickled pink to have been part of having this company come together. So uh, yeah, their their future is really bright. Uh, they've um, They've got a wonderful, wonderful project. And one thing I, I'd like to say about it as well, you might wonder, where did the hardware for their receiver, for this one radio receiver come from? And it came from the radio astronomy community. The radio astronomers mm. um, developed the original prototype stuff that put the one that allowed one radio to build and develop and demonstrate its receiver. Yeah, the radio astronomers did it. It turns out that if you want to handle a whole lot of data in a hurry, the people to talk to are the radio astronomers. And that's that's kind of the, the origin story of uh, One Radio. Well, John, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. It's been fun, Tim. Thanks so much for having me.